think of naturalization of the mind as really a long-term project that uh, has been with us perhaps since Aristotle, but certainly since the psychologists and the neuroscientists of the 19th century. I think the real idea of it is that the way the data are now, it's pretty clear that there is only the physical brain that we think and feel, make decisions and plan as a result of activity and processes in the physical brain. That there is no, in addition to the physical brain, there is no non-physical mind or soul or spooky stuff of the kind that might, for example, survive the death of the brain. So when I think about naturalization of the mind, I think about trying to understand the nature of mental processes, mental diseases, and so forth in terms of brain function. My feeling is that because of the spectacular developments in neuroscience, especially over the last two or three decades, that in a certain way the time is ripe for philosophers and neuroscientists and psychologists to collaborate that there are certain uh, ideas that philosophers can bring to the table, and, uh, but the data from neuroscience really constrains how philosophers theorize, how they theorize, for example, about what it is to have a representation of self, or to think of oneself as a self, or what it is to be conscious. And what we're learning from neuroscience can mix very usefully with the kinds of data that come out of experimental psychology and with the fruitful theorizing that can be done within philosophy. It occurred to us that folk psychology might be misdirected in certain ways. What do I mean by that? Well, think, for example, about folk physics. Folk physics is pretty much what Aristotle described. And an example would be for, that an object will move only if a force is continuously applied to that. Now, it turned out, of course, that with Newton, we began to understand the laws of motion in a very different way. We also realized that uh, uh, an idea that had been important in folk physics namely impetus as the thing that keeps stuff moving actually isn't a thing at all. That it played a role in Aristotle's folk physics, but in Newton's physics it played no role at all. Our thought was suppose that folk psychology is a bit like that. Suppose it turns out that certain aspects of the story that we, this framework that we use for understanding, suppose it turns out that certain aspects of it need to be revised as psychology and neuroscience proceed. And I think that's been borne out. An aspect of folk psychology, I submit, is that memory is a kind of single unified phenomenon. And what neuroscience has taught us, really in a quite spectacular way over the last four decades, is that there are many different memory systems and that they can be dissociated with one another. That as a result of a lesion, for example, in a structure called the hippocampus, that someone may still be able to learn skills but can no longer learn any facts. I think attention is another example where we suppose from an intuitive folk psychological point of view that there is a single phenomenon. There's just attention. Well, it turns out that the neuroscience and the psychology of that reveal that actually there are separable and rather distinct attentional functions, and there may be more than two. So in general, these kinds of developments have motivated us to raise the possibility that some aspects, and perhaps even many aspects, of this very familiar, very intuitive way of understanding others and ourselves could turn out to be reconfigured and rethought. The question to raise, then, is whether there are some categories or concepts within our 
folk psychological framework that might turn out not just to be fragmented, but might actually turn out to have no application at all. How could you tell before the science is done that there could be none? <laughs> there could be some. My own feeling is that it's likely that there are, and that the notion of the will is one such. I suspect that decision making is a set of very complex processes that is very much different from how we understand it in an intuitive point of view. I doubt very much that there is a thing or even a location in the brain or even a particular system that corresponds to what we usually in a traditional way mean by the will. Um, so in that sense, I would predict, but of course I don't know this, I would predict that we'll come to think about decision making in a really very, very different way from how we do now. But bear in mind that these are empirical questions, and the answer to the question, are there ways of thinking about ourselves that will have no purchase in the way that impetus had no purchase in, air, in Newtonian physics, the answer to those questions will come out of the science. It's not going to come as a result of a philosopher thinking long and deep in the hot tub. It's not going to come out of a philosopher analyzing a concept and using pure reason, because it's a question of fact. I think that some people are concerned about the possibility that as we reconceive the nature of mental phenomena in neurobiological terms, that something will be lost. Will we still, for example, really fall in love? Will we still uh, be able to discriminate uh, this Cabernet from that Cabernet? Um, and of course the answer is yes. That a deeper scientific understanding of mental phenomena, that is an understanding in terms of the neurobiology of those phenomena, doesn't make the phenomena go away. It just gives us a much deeper and richer way of understanding it. So let me give you a, a parallel. For a long time, it was thought that light was a fundamental feature of the universe, that it could not be explained in terms of anything more fundamental. Now, as you know, it turned out that at the end of the 19th century, it was discovered that light it belongs to the same class as radio waves, x-rays, ultraviolet, and so forth. That in fact what light is, is electromagnetic radiation. And the part of electromagnetic radiation we call light just falls on that particular part of the spectrum. So something that we thought was unexplainable in any other terms turned out to be very explainable in other terms. Now, notice what did not happen. It didn't turn out that suddenly light vanished. <laughs> it didn't even turn out that the laws about light, the laws of reflection and refraction, for example, were wrong or unusable or unworthy. Of course not. It's just that we could see why those laws obtained in terms of understanding the fact that light really is an electromagnetic phenomenon. And I think the same is true here. It's not that the great passion that one feels in falling in love will disappear. It's that it's there, all right. That's part of what the brain produces. <laughs> it's just that we will understand it as a brain phenomenon.